The Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the Exxon Radio Show or endorsed in any manner by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, the Exxon Broadcast Network, its affiliated networks, stations, employees, or advertisers. All Hit Radio. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. This is the X Zone on the Talk Star Radio Network, X Zone Broadcast Network. UK High Definition Radio, Euro High Definition Radio, Star Cable, and Exxon Radio TV.com and Exxon TV.com. Our guest this hour is Ryan Van Cleaver talking about Unplugged, my journey into the dark world of video game addiction. And Ryan, welcome to the Exxon. Hey, thanks, Rob. Thanks for having me today. Hey, it's great having you. Give us a little bit about yourself. Well, I, uh, I teach writing and literature at the Ringling College of Art and Design. Mm-hmm. I've been a freelance writer for 10, 12 years and, um, you know, been a university professor off and on for the last decade or so. Tell me, what was your inspiration for writing your book? The inspiration for writing my book was that, uh, when I started to have real problems, I didn't know where to go. I looked for answers out there and I didn't seem to find any, um, in any medical professionals or in any books. And I realized there was a real a niche there, a real void and a real need. And I wrote the book to help myself understand what goes on. That's kind of the way I work as a writer. I write to my own way to understanding things. Mm-hmm. But also too, I, I published it because I realized there's a lot of other people out there who needed some answers and some perspective. And that was what my book is designed to do, raise public awareness and get some good information out there to help people who are in crisis because of video games but also the people around them in their lives to help understand the person who's got the problems a little bit better and figure out ways they can help them. How vast is video game addiction? It's it's becoming a global epidemic. We're a little slow here in the United States. Canada's a little further along in terms of understanding and kind of combating it. Uh, China and South Korea call this their number one public health issue. Both of them have government-funded um counseling centers where people can go if they have issues or if if they're on the path to addiction or if they're already there. Hmm. China's already got a boot camp kind of series for people to kind of break away from it, you know, get you into a real rigid, structured environment. South Korea is taking some huge steps. They've got, um, they're talking about instigating bans on uh, night gaming because there's too many people playing for 24 hours and longer. So they shut down the gaming sites overnight. They're also banning certain games in their country because they're too addictive. Uh, they're also talking about modifying certain games so that you get less and less points for doing certain activities down to where you get zero points for playing as a disincentive to play more. This is, you know, today in the news, um, the big story was how addictive texting is beginning to, uh, to, to be and how schools are now taking Wi-Fi systems out of the school systems uh, so that kids cannot text because of the, the, the problems, not only that the kids are facing with the uh, with the fact that they're texting instead of learning, but also because of the the um, these it seems illnesses that are being caused by the Wi-Fi systems throughout the school. Is there a connection, in your opinion, between video game addiction and texting addiction? I think there are some strong connections. I I call myself a digital addiction recovery consultant. That's kind of the title I came up for myself. I talk to people regularly about video game addiction, Mm -hmm. but also, too, the other talk I give that's the most popular one at conferences is on social networking, of which texting, I think, is a subcomponent, Uh, chat rooms, you know, Facebook, all these different sorts of ways of connectivity. And I think that's really the common denominator with all of these. It's about hyper-connectedness, and it's about community that's developed via the social networks, the texting, as well as a lot of these games. And I think that's a lot of the strong component in all of these, and it really affects how kids see themselves, it affects how adults see themselves, and I think it affects how we operate, and also um, I think it, it affects identity. Ryan, stand by. You and I have to take our commercial break. Exonation Nation, Ryan Van Cleve is our special guest. www.ryangvancleve.com is his website. And we're talking about his book, Unplugged, My Journey into the Dark World of Video Game Addiction. This is the Exxon. I'm Rob McConnell. We'll be back in two minutes. Don't go away.
Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here, and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, this product is a real winner. To learn more about 123 Ready TV, visit our website at www.xc.com. ZBN.net. Hello, I'm Justina Marsh, and with my dad Pete, we are going to present a new show called Too Good to Be True. Together, we are aiming to discover more truths about this world and beyond. Do you have unanswered questions about the world? Do you ever wonder about aliens, conspiracy theories, or the universe? There are many shows discussing subjects such as pyramids or UFOs, but we want to relay this information based on our own research, including from spiritual means. Hopefully, listeners will be helped with their own beliefs and will appreciate the psychic insights that add to the previous research and information. We both look forward to sharing this insight and beginning this journey with our listeners. Visit xzbn.net for more information about when to listen. Exxon Nation, Ryan Van Cleve is our special guest. He is the author of Unplugged, My Journey into the Dark World of Video Game Addiction. A couple of websites, www.ryangvancleve.com and uh, www.unpluggedthebook.com. Ryan, what are some of the warning signs of video game addictions? Well, there's a lot of physical ones, but the problem with those is that they tend to mirror uh, overuse in the office sort of environment. You know, back pain from sitting at a desk or eye strain, headaches, things like that. So those aren't good indicators. The better ones happen to be behavioral um, attitudes, behaviors, things like this. Um, I would be looking for people who, when they're stopped from playing video games, like if they've got a gaming event set up and then they have to wait, play a little bit later, Mm -hmm. uh, they start to act out, get unduly upset. I mean, that's a pretty good sign that the games have a real importance in their life. Also, conversely, when they play the games, if their behavior changes. We've probably all heard about or even maybe seen the little old ladies who are so nice, but they get in a car and they drive like crazy, sort of the road rage. I mean, I've seen video game rage where a really nice, quiet-spoken person starts screaming and shouting, throws keyboards or joysticks, breaks controllers, breaks TVs, breaks the screens. That's a pretty big sign that there's a real issue, too. And another one I'd look out for, and this one's the toughest one to spot, but it's one of the most telling in terms of how serious things are, is when people lie about how much they play. So if you've got a kid or a spouse or somebody, and they're still they're playing in the morning when they get up, and then you go off and run some errands and come back four hours later, and they're still on, or eight hours later, and they say, oh, no, I, I went and did some other things, and you find out later they've been playing the whole time. I mean, there's so many levels of self-denial and deception there. That's a huge indicator that there's some serious dysfunction at, at play. What was it that clued you into the fact that you had a problem? You know, it's hard to pinpoint any one thing. I had lots of indicators that any regular, reasonable person would have noticed, mm-hmm. but that's the problem with addiction. You know, it, it, it operates in secret. It's, it's usually a secret to other people, but even when it's not a secret to other people, it's almost always a secret to the addict themselves. I mean, we've all probably seen 
or heard about, at least in the movies or in TV, where you have somebody laying on the bathroom floor and they're usually half naked and they can't even get up and they got an empty bottle of vodka next to them and they keep saying, I don't have a problem, I don't have a problem. To them, in their mind, somehow they don't have a problem. And that's about the equivalent of how bad it was for me. You know, my friends stopped uh, hanging out with me. My parents stopped calling. They never came by anymore. My wife was, you know, threatening to leave me with the kids. I had a good university job that went away. I mean, you know, really everything in my life was falling apart and disappearing. And all those things, even cumulatively, wasn't really enough of an indicator. I still thought I had things pretty well under control and my life was working. It was finally around uh, Christmas of 2007. We were living in Washington, D.C., and we'd gone back to Chicago, where my wife and I are from. We'd gone back to visit relatives. And we were coming back to D.C. It took about a day and a half of driving, and we took back roads, so we didn't have any kind of Wi-Fi or any kind of connection or anything like this. And on that second day, I was thinking, you know, I should pull over and get a Wi-Fi hotspot or, you know, maybe get a hotel room for a couple of hours just so I can check in on my games and do some other stuff. And for the first time ever in my life, I kind of had an out-of-body experience where I sort of looked at myself and said, you know, this really seems inappropriate. Why are you thinking this? But at the same time, I was I couldn't stop thinking that and wanting to do what seemed like really inappropriate. And so that probably got me started a little bit. And then a couple of days later, you know, my wife and I had a pretty big blow up at New Year's Eve. This is again 2007. And uh, I just, you know, I, I just got mad. She was saying, you know, you got to stop playing that game. And I'm like, oh, well, shut up. I can spend my free time how I want. I'm not out hurting anybody. I'm not drinking. You know, I'm not killing anybody. And, mm-hmm. you know, it just doesn't go anywhere. And so I got mad and walked out into the middle of the night in Washington, D.C. in the dark. You know, it's kind of an ice storm. It's rainy. It's slick. I ended up walking out onto the Arlington Memorial Bridge and just standing there looking into the Potomac. And it's, you know, the dark waters below. And I kept thinking, you know, my life, it really is out of control. You know, I don't even recognize this person that i become, you know. And even more to the point, I don't even want to be this person. You know, I should probably just jump in. And I started thinking, do I really mean that? And I started to realize how much really my life was out of control. And I realized the only way to ever stop it and get back into the person I wanted to be was to make drastic life choices that would be very difficult to make. And as a result of that, soon after, I canceled my World of Warcraft account. I erased the games off all my computers. I got rid of the discs, got rid of the manuals. Um, and I stopped hanging out or talking to the people who, you know, were my gaming buddies. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I eventually broke three of it. But, for, you know, this is almost three years ago. And I still kind of fight some of those urges today. What is it about video games that make them so addictive? Well, there's a lot of elements to it. And... I, some of the main ones is just, number one, is the, the competitive spirit, you know, me beating you. You know, in a sports game, Madden football just came out 2011, you know, me playing you. And, of course, with this new level of connectivity we have with the, you know, Internet, Xbox Live, whether you're playing on your computer or a console, you can play with somebody in Egypt or Ottawa just as easy as someone sitting next to you at Starbucks or in your, in your bedroom. So you have more and more people, and you want to beat them all. So there's that competitive streak. There's also the um, the option to just explore, to see what's there. You know, in games like World of Warcraft or EverQuest, there are these massive worlds where you can just kind of walk in one direction for hours. There's so much to see. There's music. There's sights. You know, you kind of want to just see what's there. Some people want to master the game, you know, be the best player. You know, that's, that's a pretty tough thing, almost impossible to achieve. So there's that impulse. But another one is, of course, the idea of um, story-driven play, you know, being part of the overarching narrative. I can go plunk down $10 and go watch the new A-Team movie or the new Disney movie. You know, and I have a nice experience for two hours. But whatever I want or think doesn't affect what happens on the screen. And the screen is the same every single time if I see the movie again. Mm -hmm. In a lot of these games, I'm in the movie, I'm the hero. What I say, think, and do affects what actually happens. And I can go back and play it again if I don't like how the outcome came. So there's so much more immersiveness. I mean, the, the amount of technology and money they put into these games it's like Hollywood blockbusters. So are, so the are we saying really that, is like being in a movie, you know? So what you're doing is is you're living in a world of um, digital reality. Yeah, that's getting to be more and more like that, you know, the idea of virtual reality. Right. And for a lot of people, and this is the danger, one of the dangers anyways, the experience they're having in these virtual environments feels more rewarding than the real life does. And you can see why a lot of real life is full of disappointment, It's full of opportunities where you feel disempowered or not respected or you're trapped into certain roles. I know a couple of CEOs of major companies. These are people with, you know, millions of dollars in their, you know, portfolios. Mm -hmm. They drive fancy cars. They can never stop being that person. Everybody treats them that way. But if they play a video game and they make up a, you know, an anonymous name, an anonymous character, they can be the quiet, weak person in the party or they, you know, they can, they, they can have different kind of identities. So for some people, games are very rewarding in a lot of ways. And the danger, though, is 
when those games feel like they're more rewarding than real life, and people choose that over real life, and that's where you really start to run into some issues. You know, we've heard of these these games where you can actually get uh, live a virtual life, marry a virtual wife uh, who is actually another person in another part of the world. And is this all part of the new electronic video gaming, uh, you know, uh, artificial world that people are immersing themselves into because? Of all the stress and all of all the expectations in the real world? I, I think it's connected. You know, here in the States, we're having so many economy problems. We have mm-hmm. unemployment. We have people with so much free time, and they're depressed and unhappy. And, you know, they play some of these games, and they have lives and experiences and adventures that they could never have in real life. And another thing about the virtual existence that's so appealing for a lot of people is it's just so much clearer. The good guys tend to wear white hats. The bad guys tend to wear black hats. When you do something right, you're usually rewarded in the games in real life. That often isn't the case or it doesn't feel like the case. So you have a lot more power. You have a lot more, you know, so options. It, so it's also it's, the, instant, it's a, the instant gratification that is the lure. That's exactly right, too. Yes, you get instant gratification. And also, too, there's this idea of connectedness and belonging because a lot of games you have guilds or groups or leagues. People expect you there. When you do good, they thank you. You know, you're appreciated. So you feel like you really belong to something. And a lot of us are kind of part of a – faceless corporation or, you know, I mean, we do so many different kinds of things that we just don't feel like we actually belong so but much in this, the game to provide this, that sense of community. But this isn't reality. This is all make-believe. I hear you. But for a lot of people, though, it's it's very persuasive. It's easier. A lot of us are kind of lazy. We want an easier feeling of these things. Uh, and another thing is, too, to, to kind of, I guess, put a point on something really important here is this. It's that if you are older, if you're in your late 30s or mid-30s mm-hmm. or older, like me, you remember a time before we had home computers or before we had the home console video games. Sure. You know, there was like, there, that's, there's like the real world, which we live in, and then there's that world, which came about in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And to us, they're so different. Now, here's one of the biggest problems. If, you, if you're under 30, you grew up with those things as part of your life. It's so much a part of your life, in fact, that you don't even tend to see the technology anymore. So for a young person, our conversation right now, Rob, on the Internet or over the phone, uh, is the same to them in terms of importance and quality of experience as texting, chatting on a chat room, over social networking, talking on headsets while playing a first-person shooter, or sitting next to each other in the nearby Starbucks. To them, there's almost no difference. So when a mom comes downstairs and says, hey, Jimmy, go play with your friends. Get out of this house. Mm-hmm. He says he takes his headset off and says, I am playing with my friends. And to him, he means it. But he's not, her, but he he's, does, she doesn't understand But it. he's not getting out of the house. He's not experiencing real life. He's living in a world of make believe. And how does this affect a how does this affect little Jimmy when he gets out into the real world where you just can't get onto your Game Boy or you can't hook up to your video game or get a log onto your computer and, and have a real life? It you know, he still has he's still going to have to pay his bills, he's still going to have to pay his mortgage. You know, what are we teaching our kids? To live in a world of fantasy and everything's going to be hunky-dory? It's like, you know, let's get Barney out there to sing I Love You, I Love Me. Well, I'm with you. That's part of what my public awareness is, is making sure that parents in particular try to set better role models, but also, too, are aware of what their kids are doing. But, again, remember, too, this is not just an issue for kids. Mm -hmm. The average gamer is 35 and has been gaming for 12 years. So this is an issue for spouses and adults, too. And they're still choosing these virtual worlds as well. So it's... It's a real issue, and it's the sort of thing that we need to be paying attention to because the stakes are pretty high. Because when yeah. you start to get your life that out of balance, focused on a virtual existence versus a real one, if the same thing happened to you, most likely that happened to me. Well, what's you the lose, difference? Uh, what's the difference between a person uh, picking up a bottle, putting down pills, shooting up, and you know, or using virtual reality as as an escape from reality? In my books, there's none. You know, in my book, there's not a lot of difference either. You know, I, I get a lot of complaints, particularly online, where people say my experience is invalid and, you know, I couldn't even have had withdrawal symptoms because I wasn't taking a substance. Hmm. But just tell that to a, you know, a gambling addict. You exactly. know, they're not taking a substance either, but boy, they have withdrawals. And we all know how dangerous that is. It's such a dangerous thing, in fact, that when you see a commercial for Harrah's or Las Vegas casinos, they always end it with an 800 number on Gamblers Anonymous. Anonymous. I mean, there's an awareness of how destructive those are. Ryan, those stand by. You and I have to take our news break at the bottom of the hour. Exxon Nation, Ryan Van Cleve is our special guest. Unplugthebook.com. We'll be back on the other side of this break with the news. Don't go away. 
This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, this product is a real winner. To learn more about 123 Ready TV, visit our website at www.xzbn.net. Exxon Nation, Ryan Van Cleve is our special guest of this hour. We're talking about Ryan's book entitled Unplugged My Journey into the Dark World of Video Game Addiction. A couple of websites www.ryangvancleave.com. That's R Y A N G V A N C L E A V E.com. And unpluggedthebook.com. Ryan, before we went to the commercial break, we were talking about uh, some of the addictions and, and how people find themselves addicted and why they get addicted to video games. So, so tell me, as a. Um, how can we call you a video game addiction counselor? How do you how do you break the addiction? And how do you get somebody to really realize that they are addicted and that it's rooting their lives? Well, uh, there's a couple of things that can be done. One is that when people are playing, oftentimes they get into sort of a time warp of sorts where if you're really into a game – you might blink and look up, and it's like eight hours later. It happened to me tons of times where I would miss, ent- I'd miss meals, I'd miss all sorts of things, and I didn't even realize it because you get so wrapped up and intensely into the games. So as a result, I think our perspective of how much time we're putting into it is skewed. So one thing that can happen is if you can get somebody to agree to uh, create what I call a digital diary, just jot down hour by hour for a couple of days or a week if they'll do it, mm-hmm. uh, you know, what they did on their, with, in, in the digital world of technology, you know, with gaming. And a lot of times if they go back and look at that, if they kept an honest journal, they'll be shocked by how much time they've actually put in. I mean, my wife did this to me. She, she kept track. I didn't. I thought I had 15 hours one week, and she said it was like 47. You know, it's just wildly off. So that's one thing that can kind of shock somebody into an awareness of how much time they're putting in on it. Um, some other things that I would not do, though, is I would not just do what feels almost the natural thing to do. If, if you've got a kid, for instance, who's gaming, well, he's got a problem with gaming, take the games away. Well, if you do that, uh, that's when kids oftentimes lash out. To connect with what we said earlier, talking about young people in specific and how much they identify with uh, you know, the sense of community and the gaming, they don't even see the technology. There are so many people and relationships you have in our lives that are virtual. For instance, I mean, if you have Facebook or MySpace, you've probably got tons of friends on there who you've never met in real life, and it would be weird to actually meet in real life. And yet they're called your friends, and you oh, feel like right. you have some okay, sort of relationship so, with right, them. All right, so we can look at that as being the pen pals of days gone by, but that doesn't – I've never heard of a story where having a pen pal has caused an addiction problem with writing letters around the world. Well, that's true, but for some people – these relationships that they have online, and it's more than pen pals because they oftentimes share secrets, you know, they really talk a lot, they spend a lot of time together, they feel like it's a lot of time spent together. So to them, it's like I talked about the way that they communicate. There's not a lot of difference in the quality of experience face-to-face or online. So for them, these are important relationships. And if a parent rips the game out of the wall or, you know, destroys the computer or the Xbox, it feels like to the gamer like the parent has basically killed all those friends. They no longer exist for them. It's not like they've you know, taken them away. It's like they're dead and gone, 
And this is why you get so many kids who kind of just freak out when the parents do this kind of thing. You know, there was the kid in Ontario, Brandon Crisp, a few years ago. His parents took away, you know, a game because he was playing first-person shooter games. They told him not to. Mm -hmm. He ran off into the woods and froze to death a few days later. You know, there's case after case of this. I mean, the, one of the big ones in the United States was in Ohio a few years back. The kid's name was Daniel Petrich, and he had Halo 3, a first-person shooter game. His parents said, don't get it. He bought it, and his parents found it. They took it away, and he went to his parents' bedroom, and he found his dad's gun, and he came out and said, Mom, Dad, close your eyes. I have a surprise, and he commenced to shoot them both in the head. I mean, this, there's story after story of this where people overreact. Well, wait a sec. Hold on here. Parents, hold on here. Hold on here. Hold on here. Hold on here. Sure. Here's this kid. He's got a shooter game. There's a gun in the house. He goes and uses the gun to shoot his parents. Now, isn't it possible that if his parents would not have allowed him to have the shooter game in the first place and they would have put the foot down, the kid wouldn't have got, had the psychological problems that led to the shooting of his parents? Like, you like know, do, these, possible. do these people have mental issues? Do the video games bring the worst out in people? And if this is the case, why aren't they taken off the shelf? Well, now you're on to something here. The, this is an issue. I think it can exacerbate existing problems, and I think it can create problems for other people. And, again, it's not just it's not just with kids. I mean, there's a story a month or two ago from South Korea where an adult couple had an infant child, and it died of malnutrition oh, for God's because sake. the adult parents, and here, here's, the, here's the real ironic part, were playing one of those life simulation games where they were caring for a virtual infant in a virtual environment to the point that they didn't feed their own infant and it died. So, so what do we do as a society? Do we put our foot down and, and, and demand that these games get yanked on the shelves? Do we police them? And if people start policing these games, then this just gives some of the radicals out there to say, see, I told you Big Brother was watching us all the time. It's a catch-22 situation. So how do we handle this? It is a tricky thing. I mean, for, for me, what I do is I try to raise awareness. I talk a lot to medical professionals. I go around the country about once a month, and I talk to different groups of a therapist, and I try to help them understand how they can better help some of these people because, again, it, it, though it looks like substance abuse issues, you know, it's parallels it or is it analogous to it, it's not the same because there's a sense of community, there's a technological component, there's other things at play here, so you can't handle a video game addiction problem the same way you can handle a drug problem or a sex addiction problem. So how do so you it handle it? Some, so how is it handled? So they have, well, it's the community. That's one of the biggest senses is that there's the sense of belonging. A lot of those other acts are private acts and they're solo acts. So if you understand that there's a sense of community in place, it's really imperative that you have a specific uh, support system in place, which I didn't have when I got away from my gaming, and that made it about as hard as possible. It's the absolutely the worst way I would ever recommend for you know someone to break away from a video game addiction is to go it alone and have no one around you to help you out. I mean, that's that's like the recipe for almost surefire disaster. I mean, I was lucky to make my way through it. But for a lot of people, you know, I think that if we have just a heightened sense of public awareness and better awareness of what the, some of the warning signs are, we might be able to have some important conversations with people uh, in crisis before they get to a real or metaphorical bridge. And that's really what some of the impulse is for what I do these days. Is technology, re is technology in all actuality working against us? Are, is technology making us weaker people? Is technology causing more psychological problems than we have ever thought possible? I think that that's a real possibility. It's hard to say. We're doing more studies on it now than ever before. You have people like President Obama speaking to the American Medical Association a year ago where he mm -hmm. says video games are real problems in our lives. And he was talking primarily about it being a sedentary, you know, a lot of sitting around yeah. and health issues. But um, I think we have a lot of behavioral connections. And recently, too, just, just this week, it's making headline news all over the United States anyways. There's a man from Hawaii who's suing a video game manufacturer from Korea for gross negligence, and a U.S. federal uh, court, a federal judge is allowing the, he threw out a lot of the, the case, but not the gross negligence part, meaning that the, the company made this game and put it out for sale, knowing that it had potentially dangerous elements and didn't give people proper warning on it. And so the guy's seeking monetary damages, and he's going after them, and the suit's going forward. I've, I've got a big problem with games that that actually reward you for killing people, breaking the law, and and half of the stupidity that these video games actually promote. Uh, I'm with you on that. I think there's a lot of games like Grand Theft Auto, where you know you beat up hookers, or you steal cars, mm -hmm. or run down pedestrians, or shoot cops. I'm not sure that's good behavior. You know, it's 
it's kind of the same thing that we had with TV, you know, 10 and 20 years ago yeah. where people were worried about, you know, even though it's just watching TV, you're not actually doing it. You know, may, maybe there, it, it's important to note that most kids see 10,000 simulated deaths before they're 18 on TV and, you know, things like that. I mean, that conversation's kind of gone away, but we're picking it up again with video games because it's not just passive experience of watching it. Now you're actually physically participating in it. So it's a much more involved situation. So perhaps the effects are more strong than just watching it on TV. And it's something I would be paying attention to. It's something I hope more people are researching and studying. And it's something that if there is an issue there, I hope we talk about it more so that parents particularly, but also spouses and adults everywhere are more concerned and watchful about these things. Are there any studies out there that show how many people who are addicted to video games and computer games actually have a problem when it comes to separating their video life from the world of reality when they're out there in the public? I have not seen a study that's got numbers for something like that. I mean, I've certainly seen studies that have numbers of how many people have issues of video games, but you're talking about people who uh, are having problems differentiating reality from, you know, the virtual existence and blurring the two together. And I would think it wouldn't be that high, but then again, I, I can't say for certain. That's just, you know, anecdotal from the people I've run across, just my own guess there. Mm. How long does it take for you as a video gaming addiction counselor to to break somebody of their addiction? It depends how far involved they are with it. I mean, there are some people who have become morbidly obese, you know, and have no other outlet for anything other than the gaming. And they game basically 24 hours a day from the moment they get up to the moment they, you know, they go to sleep. For people like that, you know, you're talking intervention. You know, you need an actual intervention specialist and you need to get them in something like a wilderness program where you completely remove them from any sort of electronic connection or technology period and then you get them off into a different environment where they can uh, reaffirm some of the values and some of the activities that most people enjoy, like teamwork, you know, healthy behaviors, exercise, and really kind of re-coach them on how to live their life more effectively and healthily. And something like that can take months in some cases, the same way that you see, you know, A-list actresses and people like that sometimes go to the Betty Ford Clinic for, for pill addiction or something, and sometimes they're gone 60, 90 days. And, you know, for some people, it, it'll take something like that. For others, but they're just on the path, sometimes, you know, with some proper coaching, the way that we have life coaching now, you know, if we just have some sort of behavior coaching and proper support, perhaps we can, you know, keep them in their environment and get them back on track within a few weeks, you know, in their own world without removing them from it. Tell me, the uh, social networking that's out there, MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, and the others, um, seems that the younger kids today are just getting right into it. And are we going to see the same thing with the kids as we're seeing with the adults when it comes to video gaming, when it comes to uh, social networking? Uh, I do think so. I think that one of the things that kids are always going to do is look for places where the adults are not. And there's so many adults now in the video game world that the kids are moving to other environments, and they're starting to take over Facebook in particular there. And, they're, you know, you're starting to see a lot more of those social networking games are more geared towards kids than uh, for others. You know, Farmville, maybe not so much so, but, I mean, even a game like Farmville, 42 million people play that every day. So a lot of the gaming that occurs isn't on your Xbox, your PlayStation, or even your home computer so much. Well, I guess, I guess it is on your home computer, but it's within sure. the context of the social network. And you're not buying a game at the you know store. You're finding it there on those sites for Mafia Wars and things like that. When you go out and do your lectures uh, and you talk about social networking, what are some of the key points that you try and get across to your audience? Well, I think that a lot of what I get across is this idea that we it's a new thing for us. We haven't studied it. We haven't you know really understood it very well yet. And I think that there's a lot of behaviors that we engage in in, this, in these forums that we would never do in real life, and it's incredibly unsafe for, for a person who's not being aware. There's a lot of predators. There's a lot of cyberbullying going on. I mean, they're doing studies now in the States anyways, in California and other places, where over 50% of kids under 18 have experienced cyberbullying. I mean, that's pretty scary stuff. You know, that's half of the people. So you get that an awful lot. So if you don't quite know what you're doing or if you're, you know, if you – if you're just not paying attention, really bad things can happen to you, much more so online because we have this feeling of anonymity, so you can do things without repercussion online that you would never do face-to-face. -face. So I think a lot of times people kind of use that as an outlet for their bad behaviors, and so there's a lot of that that goes on in the online gaming, but also in the social networking environments there where you, you know, you, it's called flaming somebody, you know, where you basically try to destroy them, you know, it's, 
it's some pretty scary stuff. Stand by, Ryan. You and I have to take our uh, final commercial break for this uh, segment, Exxon Nation. Ryan Van Cleve's our special guest. Here's a couple of websites, www.unpluggedthebook.com. That's www.unpluggedthebook.com and www.ryangvancleve.com. 1-800-610-7035, worldwide toll-free, email exxon at exxonradiotv.com, on MSN Messenger, exxonradiotv at hotmail.com, and our website, www.exxonradiotv.com. Once again, for more information on Ryan Van Cleve, here are the two websites. Ryan, RyanGVanCleve.com, that's www.RyanGVanCleve.com, and www.UnpluggedTheBook.com. We'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Hello, I'm Pete Marsh. With my daughter Justina, we will be presenting the new radio show, Too Good to be True. If something seems too good to be true, it usually is. But with the help of Justina's amazing gifts, we're going to gain insight into questions that don't yet have complete answers. Have you wondered who built Stonehenge and for what reason? Why are crop circles found in the same region as Stonehenge and elsewhere? Are crop circles a hoax or are they created with technologies that we have little knowledge of? Who built the pyramids in Egypt and also in other countries? How and why were they built? Was the Titanic switched with the Britannic as part of a gigantic insurance fraud or for more insidious reasons? What caused the Tunguska event when trees were flattened over an 800 square mile area in Siberia? Will the new insights be too good to be true? Well, that will depend on what you are prepared to believe. Please join us as we start on this journey together. For more information on Too Good To Be True, visit www.xzbn.net. Hi everyone, Rob McConnell here, and I wanted to spend a moment on internet streaming. Everybody has heard about internet streaming, but not many know much about it. Did you know the internet streams just about everything? Movies. From new releases to old classics. TV shows. Almost every show, every episode, and much more. But the question has always been, how do you do it? Well now, thanks to the folks at 123 Ready TV, I have the answer for you. They have developed a simple program app, 123 Ready TV, that you install on your Windows PC, Android smartphone, or Android tablet that can have you streaming like a pro in less than five minutes. You truly won't believe how much is available or how easy it is to do until you try. And for a one-time cost of only $19.99, this product is a real winner. To learn more about 123 Ready TV, visit our website at www.x. ZBN.net. Ryan Van Cleve is our special guest this hour. Ryan is the author of Unplugged My Journey into the Dark World of Video Game Addictions. His website, www.unpluggedthebook.com and ryangvancleve.com. Ryan, do you have any statistics to share with us? Well, sure. I mean, there was a study just not so long ago this year in uh, Great Britain where they, one of the major newspapers there interviewed a couple thousand British men and um, they determined that one-third of them would prefer to play video games than to have sex with their spouses or partners. Now, if you make it a new video game, one they've not played before, it goes up to 75% would choose the video game. So, again, it's starting to show some of the pull that this has with the different age groups. In 2007, here in the States, the American Medical Association did a study where they determined over 5 million American kids, ages 8 to 18, would meet a clinical definition for video game addiction. You know, and that's, these yeah. are some numbers that are staggering. And then here's the other thing, too. It's not just those age groups. If you look at people who are, you know, older, we're, they're gaming more than ever. Back in 1999, you only had 9% of people 50 and older gaming. Now, it's almost 30%. I don't know. Video game on one hand, making love to my wife on the other side. All right, get rid of the video game, honey. I'm coming home. 
are, are there any physiological illnesses that have been attributed to video gaming? Well, we're, we're trying to do more studies these days. There's a woman in, um, in Oxford, a neurobiologist, who's checking into some of the connections between sort of the fragmented ways that we communicate with texting, email, and also with video games and how they operate and their relationship with uh, ADD and ADHD, the way that we sort of have a disjointed way to perceive the world. She thinks there's a strong correlation there, and she's working to prove it now. So that's, that's a pretty strong you know, uh, component that's, that may be in play. Um, also, too, I do think there's a real strong thing between health and how much one games, because if yeah. you're really into gaming, you don't have time to you know, go work out. So you eat quick food, you drink a lot of energy drinks, and that's just not very good for your health either. I wonder what would happen if the if the poles shifted, no hydro, no power, the grids are down. How would this affect those who are affected, those who are addicted to video games? Wow, I don't know. It, it, they would be in chaos for a while, you know. I mean, if World of Warcraft's one of the big games out there, 12 million people play it. It goes down every Tuesday morning for updates, and sometimes it's an hour, and sometimes it's for multiple hours. And if it's on for multiple hours, if it's you know if people are offline, mm-hmm. a lot of them are freaking out. They go into chat rooms, they go into message boards, and they just talk about it. And they just count down the minutes, and they get angry if it's later. If they change the hours from two o'clock, oh no, now it's three because we had a problem. People start getting so mad. They are so connected to this. It's a real issue. I think there is something drastically wrong with the world. <laughs> I worry about it. That's what we're talking about, trying to make people understand that mm-hmm. we might be able to do something now before we have more people in crisis. Hey, Ryan, let our listeners know where they can get a copy of your book. Well, you can get it in most actual brick-and-mortar bookstores in the Canada and the United States. Uh, you can also get it online awfully easily, Amazon.com, both the CA and the American one. You can get it at BN.com. You can buy it at my website, UnpluggedTheBook.com. And that's a good place to go, too. I put links. I put videos up as new information as studies come out. I try to post it there. So there's lots of good resources, and it's all free. I also have a contact page. So if you have a question or a follow-up or clarification, you can zip me a note. I get a lot of emails, but I'll get to them eventually. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Really great talking to you. Continued success. Ryan Van Cleve has been my guest this hour. Unplugthebook.com. I'll be back on the other side of this commercial break with the news. Don't go away.